Well, we'll continue with everything that's not the fetlock. And um, this was a study that Julie Vargas did. She was an intern of mine, and this was presented in AEP in 2011. And we were looking at basically pastor and cysts and how that affected performance. And this is the proximal interphalangeal joint. Uh, the reason I wanted to do this, one, was because, remember, as I said, the Kane study did not evaluate pasterns at all. And the other reason is just anecdotally, I saw this in a lot of successful racehorses. Um, we had a yearling very similar to this lesion that we see on the right here, a proximal P2 cyst, um, come over here and become one of your champions. And um, also another distal P1 cyst that came over here and, and became a, a champion for you as well. So I also look at a lot of sales films in the November sale, and I read a lot of fillies that were tremendous race fillies, and it, you know, it wasn't a common lesion to see, but I would see some of these. But this severely discounts you in the yearling sale, so we wanted to look at it because obviously some horses are tolerating this, but how many? So this is what we might see with the distal P1 cyst on the left here. And then I just want to show you on the distal P1s, here's a slide of the same horse um, as a two or three year old. I don't, I don't know which year, but oftentimes these will fill in um, as the horse matures and with time. Often there's not enough time when you look at them on spring surveys to get to a yearling sale and have them filled in, but sometimes they do. Less so on the proximal P2s. Do I see them fill in? So this study looked at 171 yearlings, and 10% of them had a lucency in the pastern in more than one limb. So we had 188 lucencies altogether. And 72% of them were on the distal P1, which is the longer bone there is the long pastern bone, and the bottom of that would be the distal P1. And you can see the lucency there in the distal central P1. And then another one here on the distal um, condyle of P1. So the majority, 72%, were these distal P1s. 28% were proximal P2, like you saw on the previous slide. And then we did end up also subdividing them into where they were located. So midline lucencies were 41%, which is the picture on the left. And then condyle and facet lucencies were 59%, which is the picture on the right. So this is just a chart when we looked at all lucencies and we compared them to their maternal siblings as controls. We had two-year-old starts, earnings, earnings per start, and also at three. And there was no difference in any of the categories um, statistically. So we decided, well, let's split them up into those groups. And we looked at all lucencies, as, and they were not significant. But you looked at the midline lucencies, and they had less two-year-old starts where the condyle and facet lucencies did not. They were equal to their siblings. Two-year-old earnings, see the same. Midline was significantly decreased in earnings, and the condyle and facet lucencies were not. Three-year-old starts, actually, at three-year-old starts, nothing was significant. All of them raced equally, equally meaning the number of times they started, but they did have decreased earnings on the midline lucencies, right here. And then, really when we looked at this, this was a little surprising. Um, the condyle and facet lucencies raced normal, which that was good. It was good to show that. But the midline lucency was a little bit of a surprise. I think most of us have felt that that's a synovial fossa and they're not significant. Um, we don't typically see those in lameness exams. So also wondering why they're significant. Um, part of the reason could be that small ones may not have been mentioned in this study where small condyle or facet lucencies would have been, but really hard to say and obviously additional research um, would be needed. But it is um, good to be able to give clients who are in love with this horse that has a distal P1 or proximal P2 that's on the condyle or facet and really want to buy it that give them confidence in, in buying that horse. And this is our practice in Wellington, Florida on the right, which is the, um, you can tell by the palm trees. Very nice there in the winter. So the next thing I want to talk about is the, the carpi. And the upper joint is more forgiving. It's more forgiving the more, the higher we go in the knee and the more to the outside or lateral that we go. And buyers have more tolerance. Um, they're more forgiving of upper joint lesions. 
lower joint, less forgiving. Um, the more medial or more to the inside and lower you go in the knee, the more significant those problems can be. And buyers have little tolerance. Um, often when I, I speak with clients before, when you meet someone and you're trying to figure out their risk level when you're giving them recommendations on radiographs, probably the most common comment I will have from people is, I don't want anything in the lower joint of the knee. So, but at what point is lower joint of the knee okay? Um, is it not? So. So this is the fourth significant lesion in Kane's study was dorsomedial intercarpal joint disease, just to point out. So this is the upper joint, which is the high motion joint. Here's the lower joint, and then the very lowest joint doesn't, doesn't move. But you see the, the two big arrows over there. Um, those point to the dorsomedial intercarpal joint disease that um, Kane was discussing. He didn't really talk about things at the joint surface, which surprised me a little bit. He really discusses more the joint capsule um, reaction, which if I only see the joint capsule reaction, I've never been as critical. Um, but this is where I would get critical in this horse, where we have the, the lucency, you have that tremendous amount of sclerosis, almost in the shape of the triangle, that white bone that comes, that that little arrow is pointing to, um, it means a significant, significant amount of this bone is infected. Affected. Um, so of this group, 63% were starters, which was statistically less than the rest of the group. They were three times less likely to start a race. However, there was no difference in the earnings or the earnings per start. And this is all of that large comprehensive study. And then this is more on the upper joint of the knee, but um, Jen Higgins, who was an intern of mine, looked at accessory carpal bone fragments. And the reason why I wanted her to look at that is oftentimes you'll see a spur on the proximal intermediate or spurring in the upper joint. And then if you look back to this area here, there's a fragment on the articular surface of the accessory carpal bone. And I wanted to know, are, are those significant? And also, if they have spurring, how significant is it? Because they're a very hard cell. So we looked at Rudin Riddle repository radiographs from 2004 to 2007. She presented this at AAP in 2010. Um, inclusion criteria was an articular fragment off the dorsal accessory carpal bone. And then we also made notations of the amount of spurring in that upper knee joint. So of the horses that had accessory carpal bone fragment, there were 45 in the study. Um, no horses, this is interesting, that no horses in the study had any observable changes in the middle carpal or the lower carpal joint. So that was, I was glad to not have that, so I didn't try to, because um, we know that that is significant, to see if those affect them as well. I think it would kind of muddy the data. Um, and then we compared the race records to their maternal siblings. So of the 45 yearlings that had these accessory carpal bone fragments, um, there was no difference in starts at two, but there was a difference in earnings and earnings per start at two. So the accessory carpal bone fragments had less earnings and less earnings per start than their maternal siblings. And then we looked at the three-year-old. Again, no difference in starts, but three-year-old earnings and earnings per start were decreased. So they were lesser horses um, in this study. So then we wanted to subdivide it. Well, what about if they have spurs or they don't have spurs? So we separated them into three categories. The first one had no osteophytes, which was 27%. And the second one, mild osteophytes, which is less than or equal to one millimeter. Um, there were 33%. Moderate osteophytes is more than a millimeter, um, and 40% there. So category one here on the left, you can see there's a, a smooth or normal contour, contour. Category two, you just see that where that white arrow is pointing, it just the proximal intermediate starts to lip up. And I know these measurements are somewhat subjective when you're dealing with millimeters, but you can see the picture on the far right, that's more of the moderate osteophyte that you would see. But we would go from the normal contour of the bone, or what should be the normal contour of the bone, and then measure upwards to, to define the spur. So category one, which was the accessory carpal bone fragments with no osteophyte, um, there was no difference in starts at two, a trend towards significance in earnings at two, and a decreased earnings per start. 
At three, again, no difference in starts. However, there's a trend towards earnings significantly decrease, being de significantly decreased, and no difference in earnings per start at three. Category two, accessory car carpal bone fracture with the smaller osteophytes, um, mild osteophytes, two years of age, no difference in starts or earnings, but there was a decrease in earnings per start. So lesser horses there. Three-year-old, no difference in starts, but a decrease in earnings and earnings per start. And then this was the surprise. So when we got to category three, which is accessory carpal bone fragments with the larger spurs or more than a millimeter, there was no difference in any performance category, starts, earnings, or earnings per start at two or three. So we wonder why that is, and um, I think this is, this is an old paper. <laughs> it is from EVJ, it's a supplement actually, it's kind of hard to find sometimes, but for the veterinarians out there and, and trainers or whatnot, this is a really great read. Um, it's a clinical perspective on lameness originating in the carpus that Dr. Bramledge did um, when he was at Ohio State, but it's, a, it's just really good at explaining why the upper joint is more forgiving and why the lower joint isn't, and why the more medial you go on the lateral part of the lower joint, the weight or the stress in those bones gets dispersed between the ligaments, but when you get to the more medial side of the limb, there's a concave appearance to the top of the third carpal bone, and, and there's no ligament medially to really disperse it. It's bone against bone. So it's a great read, and I think it helps us to understand why these things happen. So what, are these, what does this mean? You know, we have these big spurs doing fine, and um, I think you guys are far more forgiving of these, but they kill your sale in America. I've, I've seen, actually, more of them come over here, and if you have a more of a European pedigree, I think people... Um, you know, you try to educate your owners and say, you know, if it's a European pedigree, maybe you're going to be okay, because I think you guys are more forgiving on, on most lesions, you know, in, in our discussions. But more work needs to be done with greater numbers. Um, for me, when I see carpal changes, I think I, I ask the client more, so how is the confirmation, how does the horse track through its knees, and use the confirmation as more of when I see carpal changes, how significant it is. I think, Mike, you sounded like you did the same. That, and that article that um, Dr. Bramlage wrote, it really explains it well. But one thing I think we did learn from this and is that um, accessory carpal bone fragments do warrant removal, and we have started removing them routinely. Um, but no matter what, when you have these um, significant changes in the knees, it's very hard to get any kind of buyer confidence. You know you're going to be discounted, but as an owner, I hope it gives you some information of, you know, what you can tolerate more and, and hopefully protect your horse to the degree that um, you're willing to protect them. So the next category was stifles, a um, couple different studies that were done here. Medial femoral condyle lesions, remember these weren't evaluated in Kane's study, um, so cysts or subchondral lucencies. You can see the area, so this is the medial femoral condyle with the red arrows pointing to a lucent area on the condyle, as well as some significant amount of sclerosis deep to that lucency. And then the other lesion we're going to talk, lesions, we'll talk about are trochlear ridge OCDs, so medial or lateral, and also patellar. And the reason why I looked at that is they, they have a significant sales discount, and people are scared of any stifle lesion when you say that to a client. Um, that it has a stifle lesion, often some of them will just be off the horse, and they're going to miss some good horses if, if that's all they're looking at is just hearing that word stifle. And the, the OCDs and the stifles seem to, people are more forgiving at the two-year-old sale, so if they're able to breeze and, and breeze handily, um, people tend to be more forgiving than they are at the yearling sales, but significant de discounts in yearling sales. So the, the arrow, big arrow on the right is pointing towards a, a relatively small um, lateral trochlear ridge OCD. So this was a study that Emily Sandler did when she was with us. She presented this at AEP in 2002. And what she looked at was the correlation of the lesion size with racing for horses that had um, arthroscopic surgery of subchondral cystic lesions in the medial femoral condyle. She had 150 cases. 
an important thing to note on this is, you know, when we see horses at the sales that have these lesions, they're not lame. In this study, these horses were clinically lame. That's why they were referred for surgery. So I think we have to look at them a little bit differently, but there's, there's some good information in here. So medial femoral condyle, here's a cystic lesion on, on the condyle. And what they did in this study is they, they measured the width and, and the depth radiographically. So previous studies have looked at type 1, which are, this is only looking at depth as far as the type 1 and type 2 lesions. Type 1 was less than or equal to 11 millimeters, so a centimeter deep, and type 2 was over a centimeter um, based on radiographs. And then the other thing they did at this, this paper was looked at um, the cartilaginous disruption, so how much joint surfaced was involved in length at the time of surgery. So they looked at that, and then they subdivide them into two groups, less than or equal to 15 millimeters or more than 15 millimeters. And here's the performance of these horses. So only 96 of the 150 raced, and that was 64%, whereas 77% of the maternal siblings raced. I don't have her stats on this. This is just what was in the AEP proceedings. Females only 48% raced, and 71% of the males. I don't think that's overly surprising. I think many of you um, would agree um, that it could be, in some instances, better to be unraced than unplaced. And um, so not surprising that they would move them on to a different career versus making, trying to get them to go to the races. 28% of the horses started at two. So, you know, there was obviously a decrease there from what we have seen in all these other studies. 61% studies. raced at three and 51% at four. So what they found out was this red line here or the cartilag cartilaginous surface was how much of that was affected was the best predictor of performance. Now granted, they didn't measure it radiographically, they measured it intraoperatively. But if you look at the depth of the lesions, the type one lesions, so the, the ones that aren't very deep, 69% um, of those horses raced, and the type two lesions, 61% of them raced. So not a big disparity there, but when you look at the amount of joint surface involved, um, the, the lesions that were less than or equal to 15 millimeters, over 70% of those horses raced. If they were more than 15 millimeters, only about 30% of those horses started. So you could see a, a difference in, in that group. So, you know, I think that we have to, I, you kind of have to tether out some information from the study because, one, medial femoral condyle lesions, they, they come in all shapes and sizes. And I think the reason why they can be so scary is I can't, I know I can't predict, maybe you can, but I can't predict which ones are going to become lame and which ones aren't. So it comes to that when we're looking at them, and, and we've had some really great racehorses that have had them. So, you know, when I'm trying to help a client make a decision on how much they're willing to spend, I, how I approach it is if the horse becomes lame and you need to do surgery, this is the data that we have on the horses that had surgery. So I base some of my decision or, or my information on measuring that lesion length on radiographs. I know it's different than what the study was, but it served me well, and I think it's a good indication that, that the more of the joint that's involved, you know, the longer the the flat wheel is basically, and um, plays a significance in performance. So and this was a, a larger study that I did. I presented this in AEP in 2009, and it was, we, I looked at 518 weanlings and yearlings that referred to the clinic for um, femoral patellar OCD. And these horses had arthroscopy, so they were either lame, um, had a fusion and a fragment. Those were the inclusion criteria. And there's been some previous studies, good studies, had more than 100 horses, so, so why look at this? And um, Foland um, out of Colorado State had looked at it. He had um, published this in EBJ in 92, so an older study, but he had 161 horses. 51% um, of them were thoroughbreds, so mixed breed population. Grade one lesions, smaller lesions, had a higher success rate than the medium and larger lesions. 64% of them returned to intended use, which 
when we're trying to give prognosis on thoroughbreds, I think it's really, it, we're fortunate and lucky that we can look at race records and make some of that determination. And then Dr. Hopper, um, with our practice, presented one in the AAP proceedings in 1996, where he had 119 thoroughbreds, 65% of them raced, they had decreased earnings, and he found no difference in grade one, two, and three lesions. So again, the same grading lesions as Folin. But the reason I wanted to do it again is, and I'm not just showing you an office picture, I am showing you our wall of champions. So our wall of champions is when you come into um, admissions at our hospital, there are all these pictures of horses that are eclipse winners um, and gr graded stakes winners and um, champions, basically. And the most common lesion any of those horses, why they're on our walls, we worked on them, but the most common lesion any of them have was a stifle OCD. And still, the other reason to look at it, not just because there's, there's a lot of great horses out there, how big were their lesions, one of the most, um, it is one of the most severely discounted radiographic findings at the sale. So um, wanted to look at it a little bit more in depth with greater numbers. So the materials and methods for me, inclusion criteria, they had to be less than two years of age, and they were referred to root and riddle for arthroscopy of the femoral patellar joint from 92 to 2004. You know, the, slide, the picture on the left is the typical femoral patellar joint effusion, the, the presentation, and you can see the, the fragment in there where they're actually reaching to, to get that. But you can see how the, the surface of the bone is quite irregular with that fragment where the OCD is. So I changed up the grading scale a little bit because we have some horses that don't have any radiographic lesions, but you end up going in there. Um, and this is a very small group, but I, I did put them in here just to, to know where they are. Um, have the grade ones less than or equal to 20 millimeters, the grade twos, that two to four centimeters, grade threes, four to six centimeters. And then I made that cutoff and made a group four, which is more than 60 millimeters. And if you look at the, obviously here's the patella up here. Medial trochlear ridge is the higher one, and then lateral trochlear ridge is the more curved one. And here is the lateral trochlear ridge OCD in, in this horse. So how we looked at, the, how we got those me measurements is we looked at the radiographs and we measured each lesion. So if there was one on the lateral trochlear ridge, medial trochlear ridge, and patella, we would add together the lengths of all those lesions to come up with that number. And if it was just on one, ridge, that's, that's, that was the length of the lesion. And horses were categorized using the worst grade. So if you had a horse with a grade four and a grade two, they were categorized as a grade four. So they, whatever was the worst lesion. And that was the statistical analysis. So of the 518 thoroughbreds, less than two, 175 fillies, 343 colts. Um, not overly surprising as you have the big strapping colts, um, tend to have more. Of 760 stifles that were involved, um, 242 were bilateral and 276 were unilateral. The left was more common than the right, which I think many of us see. I was actually surprised there wasn't a little bit more disparity there. So lesion location. Lateral trochlear ridge of the distal femur of the, of, um, were the most common lesions at 90%. So 90% of all these horses had this. This is an extremely extensive OCD lesion. You see it starts all the way at the top of the ridge and goes all the way to the bottom of the ridge. That one, honestly, you, can, you can, can't get much more than five to six centimeters on the ridge, so they'd almost need another area for it to be larger than that. And then the medial trochlear ridge of the femur was 24% of horses involved, and the patella, 10%. So prevalence by grade, our grade zero, only five horses, so maybe we should just throw them out. Um, the grade one horses, 62 horses, or 12%. The grade two horses were 205, so our largest group at 40%. Grade threes were 139 at 27%, and grade fours 107 at 21%. And you can see why I split out the grades three and four and tried to make it another category is because if I didn't, that actually the larger grade would have been the most severe, uh, would have been the largest a group. So here's just a demographic of, of the percentage of those grades. 
don't really need to harp on that. And this was an interesting finding, and not surprising, but interesting, that younger horses have larger lesions. So when they present to you in a clinical nature, lame, fusion, um, the younger they are, the, the larger the lesion will be. And I think that's important to note because you know, if we were doing surgery at 10.8 months of age, we were likely seeing them initially before that, and, or the veterinarian was anyway, and following them along. Um, we don't typically go right into a horse if they become lame and have a large stifle. And the reason being is they often don't have radiographic changes for two to three weeks. And then when they do, you also want them to be somewhat developed so you don't go in there and do surgery and have more OCD develop in the severe cases and then have to go back in there later. So um, these were the ages, 13.1 months for grade ones, all the way down to 10.79 for grade fours. So when we looked at unilateral versus bilateral, there was only one category that was significantly different, and that was three-year-old starts, no, sorry, two-year-old starts. There was a statistical decrease in two-year-old starts in the bilateral horses versus the unilateral, and kind of a trend in three-year-olds um, earnings per start as well. I think I misspoke there. It's earnings per start, not starts. Lesion location. If you just looked at the lateral trochlear ridge versus no lateral trochlear ridge involvement, there was no difference in any category, two, three, or four career. And when I speak about career, it's two, three, and four combined. It's not for their entire career, so we had to cut it off at some point. Patella versus no patella, no difference in that category. And, and that kind of surprised us because clinically, I think many of us see patella or OCDs and are very critical. But I think they take longer to come around postoperatively. They'll, they'll, they tend to have effusion and stay thicker, maybe lamer for longer. But from this data, they, they do come around. And mediotrochlear ridge versus no mediotrochlear ridge, there was a significant decrease in two-year-old starts only. But I think part of that may be when you, when you get to mediotrochlear ridge involvement, the very extensive ones typically will have involvement on, in all three places. So this is just kind of to show you the data. Um, we're looking at, on the top, starts, earnings, and earnings per start. And then we're looking them at two, three, and four years of age, as well as for their career, which is that two to four. And then we were comparing siblings to the study, if you look at the lower portion. So everything that there was no statistical difference is in white. And the ones that just showed a trend were in yellow, but again, not statistically significant on these four-year-old starts. So basically, no statistical difference in any category. So that's anything under the 20 millimeters. Grade twos, again, the white is not statistically significant. And then you see a decrease in starts and career starts, decrease at four and also for the career for these kind of middle-sized OCDs. And there was only that difference in starts at their four-year-old year and for the career, which we'll talk about what we think that is. Grade three, so the moderate-sized OCDs, four centimeters to six centimeters. You can see here a lot of red, so a lot of statistical significance here. Um, so we have normal earnings and earnings per start at two. Maybe that's those two-year-olds that are making it to the sale and show early brilliance. And then the four-year-old starts was no different. So a decrease in starts at two, three, and four their career, and a decrease in earnings and earnings per start at three, four, and career. So if they made it at the races at two, they were competitive, but no difference in starts at four. And you know, when we get to these size lesions, maybe it's not so much of a um, are you going to buy these? Probably not. I mean, looking at them, they, they have significant decrease. But if you own the horse, what are you going to do? You know, are you going to try to race it and just help you have some statistics behind whether or not you want to try that? Are you going to breed it? Or um, are you going to just dump it and sell it? Which, honestly, with the repository, that has helped, that has allowed people to just get rid of horses, too, because once the hammer drops, it's, it is a sale. So here's the grade fours of the, the larger lesions and significant amount of red, so significant decrease in starts, earnings, but only earnings per start at two. And I found this interesting. So earnings per start at three, four, and for the career 
was there was no statistical difference between that group and their, their siblings, siblings. So if they made it, they could be successful racehorses, but um, they weren't as competitive. They couldn't, they needed maybe no, more time in between races. So they had decreased performance at two and starts and earnings <coughs> at three and four in career. But again, that earnings per start at three, four in career were equal. So back to discuss this again, the grade two lesions, and, and even at grade two, I think grade one lesions, people are starting to be more forgiving, but still be a discount. Grade two, people are starting to not want to buy them, but really if they only have decreased starts at four, they, their earnings are comparable to their siblings. Maybe they just needed more time between some races, but these are some, some good racehorses in this group. And then the grade threes decreased in starts at two, earnings per start comparable at two. So if they were able to start at two, they were, they were competitive, and the onset of clinical signs may have delayed the ability to break and train them. But earnings and earnings per start were less at three and four. And then finally, the grade fours basically just lagged in performance, but they did have the three, four in career where they were equal in earnings per start. I think the best indicator on whether or not the horse is going to perform, I mean, here's the statistics, but whoever's in that joint, the surgeon, has the best idea, um, best perception of what's going to happen because they can evaluate the amount of joint surface involved. Is it directly where the patella is riding? And they can give you the best um, prognosis in those, in those severe cases because obviously the prognosis isn't good if you just generalize. Um, the other thing I will say is that the, the resolution of joint effusion post-surgery seems to be directly related with when the surgeon feels like there's going to be a pretty good shot that they'll be okay. So those are some things to, to look at if you have a horse with one of these. So take-home message was younger horses have larger lesions. Um, just if you look at the breed average, grades one through three have equal chance to race as the breed. Um, grade one lesions did not have an effect on performance. Grade two lesions only affected starts. And then overall, the grades three and four really lag in performance. So actually, this is the final um, paper I'm going to go over. And Dr. Reimer, who was an internist with us, did a lot of ultrasound. And she presented this paper at AEP in 2002. And this is one I quote often at the sales. And she looked at enlarged superficial digital flexor tendons in, in yearlings. And just like the horse on the right, you see these enlarged tendons, not uncommon to see in yearlings. And this study was done from 92 to 98. She looked at 58 yearlings that had superficial digital flexor tendon enlargement. Um, and that was anything over 1.7 centimeters squared, or over equal to 1.7. Um, normal would be one, maybe a little bit bigger in, in yearlings. The distribution was 33% were left front, 29% right front, and then bilateral in 38% of the cases, like we see on the picture on the right. And 29 of these yearlings had superficial digital flexures of more than two centimeters squared, so twice the size of normal, all the way up to almost three times the size of normal. So juvenile tendonitis, if you look at the picture on the right, you can, I think that one's a little bit easier to see the discrepancy, but that's the very enlarged tendon. So it's two centimeters thick. And then if you go back and look at the one on the left, this is more of a normal tendon at one centimeter. For the superficial tendon is the one at the very uppermost part of the screen. And you can see the difference in the size here of this one which is two centimeters, and then this one is one centimeter right through there. So when she looked at all enlarged tendons, 84% of them raced, 95% of them were terminal siblings, so obviously she's looking at a very elite group of horses, <laughs> or so many are racing, um, but they had an equal chance um, to race at two and three. However, they had decreased earnings per start at four. And then she looked at the tendons that were just over two centimeters squared, so grossly enlarged tendons. 86% of those horses started, only 45% at two, and then the other 41 that started, um, started at three. 
And they had decreased average earnings per start at two and at four, but there was no difference in their three-year-old year. So I think these horses, I mean, it shows from the data that they do well. It's still, like everything else, if you have some big tendon, it's very hard to make, get people to be comfortable buying them. Um, but the data supports that you can. And if you own it, then again, that's another reason to maybe protect it to some degree. Don't just give it away because you look at this, these numbers and they, these are pretty Im impressive um, for that size of tendons for these horses to, to be okay. Now granted, there's no tearing, they just have these enlarged tendons. And that is all that I have. So any questions?